Thank you so much for joining um, this talk um, and let me get started. Started. Um, so today I would like to talk about privacy by design and remote tools and what triggered me was the start of the Corona crisis and in particular um, all these news around companies who said um, uh, that privacy is just an additional burden um, and um, that GDPR requirements, so meaning the general data protection regulation requirements shall be relaxed. Um, and um, yeah, in particular, lobbying associations were claiming that and pleading for um, for lower privacy principles. Um, and I truly believe um, that this is uh, both not uh, necessary, but also um, not a good idea um, because privacy is not only about protecting um, personal data of um, data subjects, which is of course the most important thing, but um, privacy can also protect uh, business secrets and trade secrets and other stuff and also ensure security, which is um, incremental part of privacy by design. And that's why I would like to look, uh, get back into the principle of privacy by design, which was introduced in the general data protection regulation. Um, but one step after the other. So um, first of all, maybe I'm starting with introducing myself. Um, so who am I? Um, I? I'm basically a lawyer. So I started as a lawyer and um, I worked for international law firms. Then um, I moved to a medium sized bank in Düsseldorf. Um, all the time I have practiced um, data protection laws and also information security uh, technology laws. Then um, the bank was kind of more like a governmental thing and very strict and uh, a lot of processes and not very dynamic. So I decided to go back to a law firm, to an national, international law firm, because in the law firms I always used to advise um, small companies, medium-sized companies, but also big companies, but always in connection with new techniques. Um, ideas and um, I was deeply involved in their processes, which was pretty exciting. But um, half a year after I returned to a law firm, um, I got hired by um, IO, my current company, where our CTO, uh, CEO asked me if I want to join a really um, flexible and um, new startup um, dealing with uh, some great ideas and changing the internet. And um, yeah, I was pretty excited. So I joined IO. And and I'm there already for four, over four years. Um, I started as the data protection officer and legal counsel. Uh, currently, I'm still the data protection officer and I will be um, for the future as well. And I'm also leading the corporate affairs um, department, which is a mix out of uh, lawyers, security and privacy people, but also public affairs people and uh, people dealing with corporate communications. And I believe even if it's kind of a, a diverse mix, um, it's a good mix because we are looking at privacy, law, um, public affairs and communication from very different angles and try to help each other. And that is pretty exciting. So what is IO? Um, IO is a company behind the ad blocker, ad block plus, you may have heard of that. Um, um, so what we are basically doing is providing an open source extension, uh, which is blocking ads, but is also um, configurable in a way that we can block um, cookies and tracking stuff and also other things. Um, currently, we're having 200 or more than 230 employees. Uh, we are located in three different cities. Um, that is Cologne, Berlin and Malmö in Sweden. And um, our employees are working out of uh, more than 25 countries. So we are a remote company. And uh, when Corona kicked in, it was not that hard for us uh, to switch from um, somehow office work to full remote work. Um, it was just a bit of a change for people who really like to work in an office, for example, like me, but for most of the other people, it was uh, it didn't change anything because they were already working remotely. Yeah, that's briefly me. And but let's now dive into the talk itself. So I would like to start what is actually privacy by design. And I already said, um, 
uh, I want to talk about uh, the general data protection uh, regulation where privacy by design is now implemented, but um, the journey of privacy by design started way earlier. So the first um, kind of famous concept regarding privacy by design was already introduced um, around 10 years ago by the former information and privacy offer, officer of Ontario, that was Anne Kavukian, and she introduced the seven foundation principles of privacy by design. And that basically means that privacy shall be taken into account throughout the whole engineering process of software. Um, so as soon as you're starting to develop, um, privacy shall be considered. Um, that When I first have heard of this principle, that somehow reminded me of my professor I used to work for when I was a student um, already in 2004, so way earlier than N. Kavukian introduced privacy by design. Why is that? Um, he is a German um, professor, um, always working in the field of privacy, uh, looking at privacy from our fundamental rights. So he was always looking at our fundamental rights where we have the right to privacy introduced. Um, and he said, um, our fundamental rights must be always considered when technical developments are starting. So. Actually, he was already referring to um, considering privacy and fundamental rights um, in the whole engineering process um, at the beginning of uh, 2000, um, which was pretty early. And he also tried to lobby for getting a law which introduces this principle, um, but actually it never was implemented. So when GDPR which is the general data protection regulation, even the time before, because it was like two years in between where was the time to change processes and things like that, but um, the basic relations were already in place. Um, in 2016 up to 2018, a lot of people, including me, were pretty excited that now, finally, the principle of privacy by design was introduced to the general data protection regulation. And what I did now, because it is pretty important for what I would like to talk about in the next minutes, um, I added a screen, screenshot of the basic principle. That is Article 25 of the general data protection regulation. And it is split it in two sections. So section one is privacy by design. Section two is privacy by default. When looking at the privacy by design principle from Anne Karukian, um, she said privacy by default is part of privacy by design. The law now distinguishes between the two of them. What the law does not do is um, it doesn't distinguish between who can actually control privacy by design and privacy by default. So I've highlighted to you who is the addressee of Article 25. And here you can see the controller shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures uh, which are designed to implement data protection principles. What is the controller? The controller is the one who is using the software or the technique to collect and to process personal data. That is usually not the one who is developing software. And I will get, to, get back to that um, in, in a few minutes, but that is a huge issue. For privacy by default, we have the same the controller shall be the one who is responsible of default privacy sensitive settings. Both principles um, can be um, punished with fines up to 10 million euros or 2% of the total uh, worldwide annual turnover of a company. And even the whole group, it's not only the company, it's a whole group which will be measured for the 2%. So that can be quite 
high slime. So, oh, let me get back. Um, I said um, the controller is responsible for implementing data protection principles. So I assume if you're not a lawyer, you don't know what is meant by data protection principles. So last time I would like to show you um, the law because this is also pretty important for your understanding. So what are data protection principles? Data protection principles are laid out in Article 5 of the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, and you don't need to read everything. I've highlighted the parts which are the important ones. So there are um, five principles, uh, which in particular say that personal data shall be always pro um, processed in a lawful, fairness, and transparent manner. Lawful means you can only process personal data if there is a statutory legal permission or a prior consent. It must be transparent. That means um, the data subject, so the person who owns the personal data, um, must be informed about what is happening with your data. You may know that from all the privacy policies you find um, in the internet. Then there is a clear purpose limitation, meaning personal data can be only processed for the purpose for which it has been originally collected. There are a few exceptions, but never mind that are very rare ones. So in general, we do have a clear purpose limitation. So if you're collecting, for example, an email address to provide a newsletter about your products, you can't use this email um, address um, to sending information um, about other companies or whatever. So it's clearly limited to the purposes you have originally stated when collecting the data. Then we do have the principle of data minimization. And data minimization is something which was already introduced in the privacy by design uh, principle from, um, from Anne Karukian. Um, so that means don't uh, do not collect more data than the data which is really necessary for fulfilling the purpose you would like to reach. That is something which, of course, it doesn't fit um, and doesn't make sense when it comes to big data, but it is a basic principle and should be always considered. Um, data need to be accurate. So uh, as soon as data is uh, not relevant anymore, it's not correct anymore, it must be changed or it must be even erased, or deleted, um, and things like that. Then. We have the principle of clear storage limitation. Storage limitation means as soon as data are not necessary for the purpose anymore, and if there are no legal retention obligations, data must be deleted, must be deleted ASAP. So you can't so, um, store personal data forever. That is simply not permitted. And the last thing is um, data must be kept confidential and um, there is also the principle of integrity. So um, yeah, it must be ensured that with technical and organizational measures which are appropriate, data must be protected against loss, data breaches, destruction, um, unauthorized access and things like that. So that goes again into the basic principle of privacy by design. So I hope that was understandable. Let me get back to the initial slide. So privacy by design means the controller shall, shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures which are designed to implement data protection principles. So there shall be technical and organizational measures which are ensuring that the data protection principles I just explained are implemented in an appropriate manner. What are appropriate technical and organizational measures? The law in general is nothing which explicitly would state you have to do, do X, Y, Z. Why is that? Because techniques can change and measures can change, so it's a general, generally technical open, we call it that way. So um, what, the, uh, what the law is saying is, the controller has to take into account the state of the art. 
the cost of implementation, the nature, the scope, the context, the purpose of processing, also the risks which are um, uh, related to the processing of uh, the specific personal data and things like that. And only such measures which are um, appropriate in that manner must be implemented. So there is not a clear right or wrong. You always have to figure out for the specific case what kind of measures are appropriate. And as you can see, the more sensitive data are, the um, stronger the measures should be to protect personal data. So you can always start with a risk matrix to check is personal data first um, uh, sensitive? The less sensitive it is, um, the less likelihood we have that, um, or the, the less measures we need to implement. And in addition, addition, we also need to check how likely it is that per, uh, personal data can be exposed because of the way personal data is processed. And both need to be taken into account, and then you can start uh, thinking about appropriate technical measures. So that's a basic principle. So getting back to what I was already triggering, kind of. Article 25, so the uh, privacy by design principle, only addresses the controller. And I already said that is usually not the developer or manuf manufacturer. And also the data protection principles say that the controller is responsible for the compliance with data protection principles. It's always a controller, it is not the developer. You may already see the problem. We do have a recital. Recitals are designed um, to help with the interpretation of the law. And this recital, uh, 78, says, um, of course, um, developers shall be encouraged um, to enable the controller to fulfill their responsibilities of privacy by design or compliance with the general data protection regulation. As you can see, that is very vague. First, it is not a law itself, it just helps with the interpretation and it does not clearly oblige a developer. And then again, there's another article that's um, Article 32, which is um, uh, telling the people what can be, for example, technical and organizational measures. And that is also address, uh, only addressing the controller and sometimes the processor. So if you're using a cloud service provider um, who is storing data on your behalf, then they also must ensure technical and organizational measures. Um, but the developer itself is not addressed. So now we have started with the law and now I would like to get back to the corona crisis and why um, I would like to talk about privacy by design now and then we will try to bring both perspectives together. And by the way, um, at the end, we will have a lot of time for questions and answers. So if you have anything in your mind, um, make a note and uh, let me know at the end. Uh, it's easier for the moderators to do it that way. So what is the current situation? If you're looking at the graph on the right side, there is a slight overview um, on the time from 2013 to no, no, uh, fr fr from September last year to March this year. And it shows how many business apps have been downloaded during that time. And you can see it's pretty stable until March. And in March, mid-March, um, around 90% more business apps have been downloaded than in the average uh, amount of downloads before. That's quite a lot. And um, I can totally relate to that. That was exactly the same we have seen at IO. So I will show you at a later stage that we have introduced a so-called security and privacy review process, meaning um, no 
third-party tool can ever be introduced without running through that review. And these reviews have tripled. That was crazy. We received so many questions for no to, uh, and requests for so many tools, and we weren't able to handle that. So at the end, we introduced the tool stop, but um, that's a different story. Um, so I guess that was basically the same for almost all of the companies. Why is that? Um, everybody started to work uh, to send their employees home and let them work remotely even if the companies haven't been a remote company. Of course, only if it was possible, talking about office people. Um, so, and what kind of tools um, have the companies chosen? Being not experienced, um, having no big own IT um, department, no developers who were able to deal with, for example, open source tools. They were, of course, going to proprietary software and cloud tools. So what's the issue with that? All these tools are processing personal data of our employees, of partners, of customers, and many more. They are processing personal data. They can access these data. They can provide maintenance, maintenance and by providing maintenance, accessing such data and things like that. The majority of tools is not hosted in the European Union. And as we are talking about proprietary software and cloud solutions, um, the company itself, so the controller who is actually processing personal data, does not have the full control of, over what is happening with data processing handled by these cloud providers. And now, thinking about what I said in connection with Article 25, Privacy by Design, Responsibility for privacy by design um, lays with the controller, but the controller does not have the full control over that. Here you can also see a graph um, of the biggest large tech giants. And as you can see, um, that are mostly American ones um, or like Alibaba, Asian. Um, but they are, of course, not European countries. They are almost all cloud providers, as I already said, and the, um, the graph just um, proved, uh, proved that right. And they are all proprietary. Um, so that is exactly the issue. I would like to give you one example um, now trying to connect the law with, um, uh, with the issue such providers are having. So some of you may roll your eyes now because Zoom is a story uh, which has extensively um, discussed in, in the press already and a lot of people were bullshitting. I don't want to, want to bullshit about Zoom, um, but I would like to use it as an example why not considering privacy by design or um, lobbying for um, more relaxed privacy regulations can be an issue for your business. So I said at the beginning that privacy by design can be punished by pretty high fines. So 10 million or 2% of the global annual turnover. Nevertheless, privacy by design is somehow uh, under the ra radar of many companies. It's not popular, it's not prominent, it's not visible. Um, I, I really don't know why, but um, it seems to be uh, not an issue at all. But um, now look, getting back to Zoom, what happened there? Zoom is a video conferencing tool um, which is proprietary, um, coming from the US, um, and it is a tool which have provided video conferencing in a pretty new way. So it really thought from a user perspective what is needed to make video conferencing convenient and to provide an experience which is somewhat comparable with in-office meetings. 
like raising the hands, showing a lot of people at the same screen at the same time and things like that, having the breakout rooms and stuff like that. That is basically what all the other video conferencing tools are now doing as well, um, but they are always a step behind Zoom. So um, they were really innovative, but um, their default settings have never been very privacy friendly. They are now trying to fix it. They had a 90 days um, uh, freeze of features uh, to ensure to implement a bit more privacy and security, but their default settings have never been very privacy friendly. And they even um, committed um, in, uh, in meetings that their focus is not on security and privacy, which is from a business perspective even understandable. Um, nevertheless, they had a lot of data breaches in the past and major security risks. And for example, the one for Windows users where um, um, the linking caused Windows to send the person's um, Windows login name and their NTLM password hash, uh, which made it possible uh, to access almost everything. Uh, and that's a big security risk. Um, it's a risk not only for personal data of participants, it's also a risk for the company's business secrets, which are accessible on the computer or the device of the user of Zoom and things like that. Um, so Zoom bombing had been an issue, of course, uh, but there are so many more things. So Zoom itself was never focused on privacy and obviously they haven't implemented privacy by design. Um, so the only angle um, a company would have when uh, using Zoom is um, to use the option they are having to change default settings, which is then privacy by default. So the second uh, paragraph of Article 25. Looking again in the, uh, to the engineering process and the uh, life cycle of designing software and services, you can see here that what I already mentioned, privacy by design is something which is in the control of the developer. It must be implemented in the engineering itself. At a later stage, the only chance a controller has is to either ask for custom or either do customization if it is possible or changing default settings. If the developer and the manufacturer provided the option to change default settings, not every tool provider does so. So the options when it comes to privacy by default are very limited. But now we have the question, how? can a company comply with privacy by design if they are not the developer of a tool and they don't have the cap capability to um, use open source tools and to customize them in a way that they fit their needs. Not every company can do that. Um, from a personal perspective, uh, for, from, um, from a uh, yeah, headcount perspective, but also in, some do not have enough money to just um, hire an external company to do the customization process. So what can a company do and how can they indirectly force cloud service providers, proprietary tool providers to implement more privacy by design into their products? Because that is the only angle a controller has to change things. So what I would suggest is that every company thinks wisely before they are choosing a new tool, meaning they have to invest in checking how, whether a tool provider meets the requirements of the general data protection regulation and also fulfills basic security needs. If a tool provider allows default setting changes and things like that. So now you can see um, our tool review process, which looks pretty complicated, but it basically is not. 
So when looking at the beginning, you can see the red dot here, um, we are receiving a tool request where, we're, where we are requiring quite some information about um, what is the name of the tool, who is providing it, where is the provider seated, is it a cloud tool or can it be also hosted on premise, what is the purpose, um, what kind of data will be processed and things like that. Based on that, um, we are starting two processes. First, we are starting with um, the privacy review process. And there we are checking whether a data processing agreement is required. That is always the case when the tool provider has access um, to personal data. That is already the case if they are providing main maintenance or doing a usual hosting. Um, so basically almost um, all the time when we're talking about software as a service. If so, we are starting a contract review and checking whether um, the documentation the provider has provided to us is compliant with the uh, applicable laws, basically the general data protection regulation. Please remember that one because um, I will get back to that at a later stage. If it meets the requirements, uh, we are requesting signature and we would approve um, the privacy review. Of course, that's now a very short version. Then it goes to the security review and um, in the security review, we would check all the documentation the provider is providing. We would do our own research about uh, whether the provider suffered from any vulnerabilities, data breaches in the past, and check all information which is uh, somehow available anywhere, um, also checking uh, forums and things like that. What kind of controls have they implemented and other things. If everything is sufficient, the security review is also approved. And then the security and privacy pre uh, review in general is approved and the respective team can um, can ask our operations team for implementing the tool and acquiring it. If not, here we are talking about uh, starting with a privacy review, for example. Um, if the terms are not compliant with law, we, we are starting to renegotiate with the provider. And either the provider is um, implementing um, compliant provisions with the law, then um, we are getting back to the usual process and would uh, approve the privacy review. If the provider does not, we won't have an agreement, we won't check security settings, we will just say the privacy review is rejected and please check out whether there is another tool. But you're maybe now wondering what has that to do with privacy by design? There are two angles where we look a bit deeper than I just mentioned. That is a contract review and that is a security certification documentation. In both parts, we are deeply looking into what kind of measures the provider has implemented regarding privacy by design. Um, are there any measures um, uh, in their documentation? Can we see that from the certificates? We are also starting testing um, as far as this is possible um, and checking out whether there is privacy by design. We are also checking how default settings can be influenced, how much customization is possible and things like that. And asking of course for help from our um, IT people. Um, yes, that's what we are doing here. And only if that is sufficient, we are going for um, uh, approval for the uh, product. We would always tell the teams why we have rejected um, a tool in particular when um, privacy by design hasn't been implemented sufficiently. And we also ask the teams to either get back themselves to the tool provider and provide them with the feedback or we are helping with that and providing the feedback um, to the provider. And of course, when talking about really, really, really big players, um, they do not really care. But as soon as the company is not um, one of the large giants, 
they are actually interested. At least that's what I observed. They are asking why, what, what is exactly your problem? What can we do differently um, um, to, to get used by you? And um, so they are at some point flexible. So I have the feeling that the feedback um, really makes a difference. And in addition, if every uh, company would do so and just reject uh, tools which are not providing sufficient measures to implement privacy by design and by default, and um, nobody would really use tools which are not compliant. And then indirectly, they would change their habits. You may remember when GDPR was introduced two years ago, there were so many issues around privacy and non European players, but they changed a hell of things just to get compliant with GDPR because the companies now here in Europe are now scared to receive fines, to be punished with fines and told their providers, we, we can't act this way anymore. You have to change that. And they actually did slowly but surely. And so it can have an impact. So I can highly recommend um, to, to ensure that um, only tools will be selected which comply with privacy by design. And here again, um, what is the part of the design? What we are looking at that are the basic principles, the data minimization principle, I already mentioned in connection with the data protection principles, um, then um, data should be um, hided uh, in particular, Thought anonymized or anonymized, if possible, um, we are checking whether a provider is separating data, whether data can be aggregated, so meaning a data would be grouped, whether the information policy is very transparent about what is actually um, processed and collected. Um, then the control over the default settings I already mentioned a couple of times. What kind of policies the provider has implemented to comply with GDPR and also how they are demonstrating compliance um, in their documentation and things like that. If you are interested in that, uh, feel free to check out uh, the ENISA Privacy and Data Protection Principles from 2015, but they are still um, very relevant and up to date, I would say. Link is provided um, at the bottom. So that's it. Um, and we have four minutes left. And I would like to open the floor for any kind of questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, if you have questions, please write them in our chat that I can unlock you, that you can ask them. Or if you don't feel confident to ask them uh, with audio, I can read them out loud so we can all hear that. It doesn't look anybody has any questions. Or can you see anything, Judith? No, I can't see anything. Um, so either uh, we make uh, made up for the time we lost at the beginning, uh, which is also a good thing, or everybody is too shy or everything is clear, or I confuse everybody too much with me talking all the time. Yeah, I don't hope it's the last one, but um, I think, and I still see, uh, did, don't see any questions. Uh, ah, there, there is one. So the problem is more the data retention third parties are another um, a vector problem. Self-hosting on service is a way for privacy by design. What uh, do you think about the shady market about seal info? What do you exactly mean with seal? Uh, with sell info, ah, now it makes sense, okay. Um, yeah, uh, what do I think about that? Um, I have a very clear opinion on that. Um, I always told everybody, um, stay out of that. Um, don't buy any of these kind of data. Um, and if I can see a pattern, either is, uh, from the press, from any hints, or from their policies, um, usually you can already see that in the policies that they would have very wake wording. 
I'm always uh, saying, no, um, don't use this provider, go away. Um, that leads into huge discussions, of course, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't, uh, I can't support it in any way. So you said that the problem, not the developer, but the bad enterprise policy capitalism. Since, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't want to claim the developer itself. So when I said developer, I meant more the producing company behind it, telling their um, developers how to do things. Um, so I fully agree. It's not the bad intention of the developers. It's rather the opposite. Um, what I can see from our developers is that they are even more privacy conservative than, than I am. Um, that's... Uh, first of all, very surprising, but also a, a great thing. But you're right, it's uh, capitalism. Yeah, thank you very much for answering these questions. Uh, so I think there was enough time to add another question, but I still don't see any. Oh, there, there's another one. One How you to read or should I? I can. How does your company implement the GDPR requirements in product development? Yes. Um, so we have also introduced a, a similar process to the one I showed you for the tool review process. Um, so in general, whenever we are starting to develop anything, um, the data protection officer, so um, myself in person, and I'm then delegating to the team or doing it on my own, are... Um, um, are included so we would be already included from um uh, from yeah idea thinking um to starting with the first prototype um structuring data flows um and then um bringing it to the first beta version and things like that so actually we are involved in all stages so we basically do privacy by design You're welcome. So, maybe there is one last question. I think we can wait half a minute. We have it, since we started a little bit late, but yes. And it doesn't look like that there are more questions again. And I hope there isn't popping a question up now if I say that. So I would like to thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. And yeah, we like to see you out in maybe one of our community rooms. And we wish you all a nice FrostCon. Thank you very much all for listening and also for you um, as, um, as a host um, to make that happen and helping me in advance so much.